Welcome to the Up Arrow Podcast with William Harris, featuring top business leaders sharing strategies and resources to get to the next level. Now, let's get started with the show. Hey everybody, William Harris here. I'm the founder and CEO of Element and the host of this podcast where I feature experts in the D2C industry sharing strategies on how to scale your business and achieve your goals. Uh, my next guest today, I'm really excited about. Uh, he actually had me on his show, so if you haven't seen it, please go check out that episode on 2XC Commerce. Um, but Coonley Campbell, Coonley is a co-founder at Octillion Capital Partners, an acquisition platform company and major consolidator of clean FMCG slash CPG digital first brands. Coonley is the author of the soon to be released book, although when this podcast comes out, it might actually be officially out here. Uh, e-commerce growth strategy spelled with the hyphen in the e-commerce. And I'll get back to that here in a second. Um, he is an e-commerce advisor, international speaker, and host of the 2X e-commerce podcast, where he's interviewed over 450 commerce leaders. Coonley, really excited to have you here on the show. Thank you so very much. I'm not sure who's more excited, yourself or me. I, I'm, I'm elated, honored to be on, 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 on your podcast. I appreciate that. I know that we've had a lot of good conversations over the years. I was trying to think back to how we originally met each other. And I think it may have just been through a, like a Shopify Facebook group or something, you know, almost seems like a decade ago. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, I've, I've met some people. So back in the days when, when I joined Twitter in 2007, sure. between 2007 and um, no, 2000, 2009 and 2011, I had seen as in I'd met some people had flown over to Oxford and vice versa um just to meet 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 me in person and That's yeah cool. these these things you, you never know we're humans and you know these connections yeah. just you never know where they they take you to right it's fun um I want to get into your backstory and then there's uh, I want to get into the three pillars for e-commerce growth that you outline in your book um mm -hmm. before we do I want to announce our sponsor this episode is brought to you by Element. Element is an award-winning advertising agency optimizing e-commerce campaigns around profit. In fact, we've helped 13 of our customers get acquired with the largest one selling for nearly $800 million. We sold one to GoDaddy. One actually recently IPO'd. Pretty excited about that. And we were ranked as the 12th fastest growing agency in the world by Adweek. You can learn more on our website at element.com, which is spelled E-L-U-M-Y-N-T.com. That said, enough of the boring stuff, on to the good stuff, the stuff that we actually care to talk about here. Uh, Coonley, tell me about the backstory. You're obviously now at the top of your game, but what brought you to where you are today? Long story, short story. I, yeah, what would you like? <laughs> this could be, you know, if there's anything interesting that you, you wanted to talk about, we can get into it. Otherwise, okay. uh, however long or short you want to go with this is fine with me. Okay. Okay. Um, so, so if you don't know me already, I'm, I live in, in the UK. I, I live in Oxfordshire. Um, it's a very, very sort of education centered part of the UK. It has arguably the best university in the UK, University of Oxford, and then it's Cambridge, depending on who you talk to. Sure. Prior to, to, to all of this, I grew up in Nigeria in in Lagos, um, pretty sheltered life to be to be frank um so both my parents are medical doctors and um essentially my world was different we we didn't have we weren't wealthy per se um but we i had i think i had a lot of values like core values values on behaving on turning up in the world you know core values mm -hmm. like honesty like doing doing onto others the way you, you know just doing onto others the way you, you'd, you'd have them do, do do to you that was like a core golden right. principle um christian family um i i um i i i, I, I grew up in in kind of like a sheltered area so imagine lagos is a very hostile and bossy you know part of, of africa or the world but we grew up like in a hospital compound because my mom worked in the hospital mm. and she was eventually, uh, she was in a college, a college of medicine. So all our, our neighbors, even though we, we, we lived in, in apartments, 
you know, um, all our neighbors were doctors. So it was like a village. So we knew everybody worked in the same place and they lived in the same community. It was a very closed community. Um, and it had a lot of perks. So there were like power failures all around, you know, Nigeria. And we didn't have power failures because they had to keep the hospital, you know, going. Sure. So fast forward anyway, um, um, as I grew up, I started to see the real world. Um, I did my university in the University of Lagos. I, my first degree was in economics, um, finished it at 20, uh, finished my, my first degree wow. at 20. Um, and I went, I started school very early. I started school because my dad started school. My, my dad was in university at 16 or 17. Um, he, but, but I wasn't like an A plus student. I was, I was just average. Um, so back in the days I thought I was going to get into IT, you know, so I, so I started to, to figure out like, you know, the dot com. it was in the nineties. Right. So I heard a lot about, mm -hmm. you know, the whole dot com thing. So when I finished university, I had time. So I didn't, I didn't go into banking. I didn't go into investment, but I, I just went for some courses on how to program. I learned how to program C plus Java. Um, I learned a little bit about networking and, you know, building computers out and I didn't really like it, but, but I, I learned it to the point where I could teach people. You know, so I started mm. teaching groups of people in the institutes I worked for. Um, and then I didn't like it. I tried networking. Um, I worked for a telecommunications company. Didn't like it either. I felt like a mechanic. I was, when things broke, I had to fix it. I wasn't like in the network design area. And this, I started to look outwards. I was like, okay, let me look for a course that merges everything together. So I, I go into e-commerce, e-business management. I work at university in the UK. And my first lecture, I remember, was with um, a professor called, um, he's now a professor, it's called Dave Chaffee, or doctor, rather, Dr. Dave Chaffee. I st he's still a friend of mine. And it was mind-blowing. It was mind-blowing what you could do from a digital perspective. Sure. So that was my calling. Um, it was my calling in 2004. So um, right after that, we're meant to select dissertations, right? Um, so I made it a point of duty to find dissertations related to that first course. I, I don't know whether people know how masters work. When a master's program, you do an intense course over five days, Monday to Friday, and then you 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 depending on what your timetable is, you you you're given a an assignment which you're meant mm. to submit six weeks after, and then you have breaks. So the our first course um, then followed the selection of our dissertation. So I looked for a company that was into I was looking for help. They were looking for help in search engine optimization. And and I I paired up and said, look. I could potentially help you guys. You can, you know, I'll be really up for it. I interviewed with two other people, with many, many people. They selected three of us, probably due to my work experience. And I gave it all that I could. Um, mm -hmm. I made a distinction from that master's degree. And then I started working for that company eventually. I worked for that company for about four years. Um, and then I, I went on my own as a consultant. And then I, I, I went on to run an agency. It was called Foz One. It was a local Oxford um, you know, SEO agency. I was doing good for, for our community. Um, but fast forward um, in 2014, I really started to, to pay attention to like affiliate marketing. And I realized that there's a huge world beyond just lead generation. There's a huge world in e-commerce. So I set up um, 2X e-commerce, my, my podcast, um, just to learn. Um, I'm just trying to fast forward a lot of things um, to it. learn about e-commerce. And um, with e-commerce, I started out with essentially demand capture. So it was like, you know, um, what are people searching for? They're searching for, um, you know, a, a fan or a baby straw, uh, you know, stroller. And then, you know, I just make sure that my clients or, you know, my, my, my fly by night websites would, would rank for, for those, you know, terms and, and then, you know, uh, hopefully, you know, wish for conversions. But I realized that this was just a, um, it was, it was, it was just a, a tip of the iceberg, you know, in terms of what it really meant to grow an e-commerce business. And, um, that put me into the world of demand creation, which is more, Add social advertising, learned about, mm -hmm. you know, social advertising, um, learned a ton about social advertising all through that with all my fly by night websites and actually being an e a digital marketing, you know, uh, manager, I learned a lot about UX and UI. We used to hire like lots of UX and UI agencies. So I blended that into my experience and I go into CRO conversion rate optimization. I, I learned from 
from the greats, from like Pep Lyre and, and many of yeah. them, you know, so I, I attended lots of conferences and, and that because I just wanted to, to bolster my understanding of e-commerce so I'm more holistic because the times when yeah. I'd promise customers, you know, you, we'll double your traffic and we will double their traffic, but the the effect, the same net effect in, in a traffic double does not necessarily mean right. that you, you see that in revenue. And it, that just got my... My my head going, uh, and so I I um you know I I started to look more into strategy, into growth. I started working as a as an outsourced CMO um, for for a number of startups and and established e-commerce businesses, and um I just made a decision a few years ago that I was going to go into private equity. I read uh, I tend to read book before I get into something new. I tend to read three maybe four books on on that particular concept. I read a book on that. And I thought, wow, I said, there's no way I could I could do it on my own. So I started looking for a co-founder. And the interesting thing, this is serendipity. I was I was um trying to write my book, actually, and I was I was trying to get, you know, my backstory on okay, what universities did I apply for for my masters, right? You remember when mm-hmm. I told you about I did my masters? And I remember applying to University of Westminster and University of London Burbeck. And, and so I, I typed University of London Burbeck e-commerce business management just to get information to put into my book. And I came across IS Profile. And I was like, damn, I said, this guy is doing exactly what I was what I want to do. He is doing sure. um, search. He was, he was more like a search. You, you call them, um, you, 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 you call them, um, it was a search fund. So a search fund is a, 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 a unit like you or me or a group of people mm-hmm. who want to acquire one business and optimize it to the core and just use that to be their job for life or flip it in 10 years. Sure. So he was looking at one, we synergized and we thought, look, we could, there's a lot of aggregators going out there, but um, what are our values? So um, we, we didn't sign any dotted lines till, till about six, seven months, having sort of spoken, caught up and everything. So we looked at that mm-hmm. values. Um, I remember I fell ill in in, in my in my youth. Um, I was twenty nine. I fell ill, like seriously ill, and that incident made me value life, and also mm-hmm. made me value yeah. the importance of um, a good diet, one, and 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 and, and, and an active lifestyle. Because those are the things I really, t- after the drugs, those are the things that really turned, sure. you know, my, my perspective on my, my body, my, my strength, my, you know, around. And I was like, if I'm going to do anything, it's going to be good for you. So yeah. we decided to double down on CPG brands, you know, so, so, so essentially things you eat. Um, so consumer packaged mm. foods as well as, um, you know, health and, and beauty. So, so what you put in your body and what you put on your skin. That's kind of like um, the space where we're at, um, but we're we're looking for like digital first e-commerce businesses that mm-hmm. um, essentially um, have the potential to be well beyond digital, you know, in the long term. Sure, it's uh, it's brilliant, and I and I like that you you've obviously been through a lot, seen a lot, and and you're this this not I hate to say jack of all trades, master of none, because I think you're jack of all trades, master of quite a lot. You're, you're somebody who has poured yourself into all of the different facets of e-commerce along this, you know, growth trajectory. Um, and, uh, you know, something you said that I appreciated was um, how you poured everything into even your master's degree, right? You were like, okay, you've got this project and you, pour, you poured into this um, 100% and above and beyond 100%. And it reminds me of something that I saw, I believe it was Jason Pfeiffer uh, just call out this morning on LinkedIn. He's the uh, editor-in-chief over at uh, Entrepreneur Magazine. Mm -hmm. And he talked about how Barbara Corcoran uh, just fell under a lot of fire for saying something along the lines of how interns who want to stand out should uh, do 50% more than what's asked of them, right? Like go above and beyond. Uh, And she got into a lot of trouble for this. Uh, You know, there's a hustle culture. And uh, here's the thing, though. If you want to stand out, if you want to not just stand out for the purpose of a job, but you actually want to be great at something, that's what it takes. Nobody gets to the Olympics by saying, I want a well-balanced life. doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. Nobody ends up Mm -hmm. in the NBA 
or anywhere that is, you know, at the absolute most elite um, of whatever their field is by saying, how can I do this the most balanced way possible? Mm-hmm. Now, I'm not saying it's a good idea. I'm not saying that you should be that type of person who says that I'm going to pour everything into this because you'll be giving up a lot of other things to do that. You will give mm-hmm. up a lot of balance. You will give up a lot of other things that are absolutely, maybe even arguably more important than being the best at your field. But mm-hmm. if you want to be the intern who gets noticed, in if you want to be the person who says, I'm going to be at the top of my field, mm-hmm. that's kind of just what it takes. And I just, I like seeing that hustle and that drive from you um, that you, you, you outlined. That's uh, something I feel like is in rare supply oftentimes. Thank you, Will. Thank you, Will. I just want to add that um, if you're intrinsically motivated, so sure. if you're, the reason your why comes from from the inside from a pain from in fact um there's, there's this stuff i shared there's this post i shared on on on, on instagram yesterday which is like we they they start the cia actually studied um or studied like high performers they realized that they all all high performers have a certain level of trauma that's not toxic enough to mm knock them over to substance abuse to to mental health right. crisis but it's a pain that they're trying to 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 really resolve that gives them that push gives them that energy to push on and it has to be intrinsic it has a, it, it shouldn't be oh i'm trying to impress this person yes right. that's part of the whole thing right. but where where are you going where why some people do it for their children you know some yeah. some people do it for the for rejection you know some people are trying to oh that my girlfriend that that you know that issue i had from my love life i'm going to correct it um some people saw pain as children you know they just didn't have mm-hmm. enough and they they push push through but you know just coming to terms with that truth your truth knowing your truth um will be quite critical whatever the situation and however you define success and what's interesting, without going too too much further on this, because I want to get into some good uh, stuff on your book here, but uh, sure. Alex uh, Hermazi says something along the lines of, and I appreciated this, we want our children to, let's say, be patient without having to go through the things that make them patient. We want them to be mm-hmm. strong without having to go through the things that make them strong. And I mm-hmm. think about that oftentimes, just even in my own life, how many times do I wish for the solution without having to go through the journey that gets to that situation where it's like, mm-hmm. if you want to be successful at this or to be able to do, you know, X, Y, Z, uh, like you were just saying, where it's like some of these things, they may be somewhat painful. They may be even a bit traumatic, not saying that I wish any pain or trauma for anybody in life, but simply saying and acknowledging that some of those things were the necessary catalysts to create the change that was going to happen. Absolutely. You've got to tear muscles to grow muscles, right? So I'm, I'm more, yeah. I'm a fitness guy and I, you know, the, the first few days, if you, if you've not, you know, been, been to the gym or you're not fit, yeah. the first few weeks, your first four weeks determine if you're going to keep it a habit or not, mm. because there's going to be a lot of pain. And then you learn to live with the pain and then you learn to love the pain. You don't even learn to love the pain. You just love it. You know, it's, it's feedback and then you, yeah. you, you just grow. Uh, I, we could go on and on and on, on these concepts because I'm very, very, very passionate um, because I live by, by a lot of, you know, these principles of, of pain, of putting in the time, of turning up on a daily basis. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It is so important, you know, whether it's with your team, whether it's with the new, with the new manager, or whether it's with yourself, you know, just, just habits. Yeah. Um, I was, I wrote something this morning around habit, which is like, to be honest, right. Where, where like programs, you know, so, so I remembered, so I just, in the gym, I had a flashback about space jam. I love it. And I remember when the, the original, I haven't seen the, the new space jam, but I've seen the, the, the old one. I've seen it actually saw it a, a few months ago. And, um, do you know, when, when they go into the bodies and they're like, they, they lost all their skills I was like, yeah, what if yeah. like, like our brains, right? Our brains are like computer programs, right? So mm-hmm. with a habit, you're writing, you're actually writing a program in your brain. Yes. It's, it's like you're writing Absolutely. code in your brain. Yep. And then when you need to play that software, you, you, th- that's how you execute, right? Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. So, so in order for us to to really be what we want to be, we need to understand, okay, what is a program? How can we write it? Which is repetition, you know, on a regular basis and, and growth. Yeah. And then you have skill. Yes. So speaking of writing, because I'm with you 100% and, and, I, and yes, I could go on that. We could re- spend the whole rest of the podcast talking about how to write the right software for your brain. But speaking <laughs> of writing, you came out with a book uh, called e-commerce growth strategy. And I was going to call out that you use the hyphen in there because there's always such a debate about whether there's a hyphen or not. And we always spell it without the hyphen. I love that you always have. And I feel like even when we talked about guidelines back when I had, um, you, you wrote a po- blog post on uh, the Cellbrite blog for me years ago before they were acquired by GoDaddy. And, and same concept there where it's like, you know, what's the guideline on how do you write e-commerce? Is it lowercase e, capital C? But anyways, <laughs> So, so those who are listening and you don't see the way that this is spelled, it is e hyphen commerce. So make sure that you look for it correctly. But you know, you not, identify, not my decision. Sorry, not your decision. Oh, no, interesting. It was, it was a publisher. How do you it was like a pub- to spell it? I like to. I just like little letter e with a capital letter c and then yeah. commerce. You know, if you look at the two x e commerce, it's that. Yeah, yeah, that's true. But, you know, when you're working with partners. <laughs> it is what it is. I think you know they they have in their cat- back catalog. That's 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 their own namings convention. This is yep. the thing about not not doing your thing per se. Um, but yeah. It is what it is. <laughs> no, that's good. So I I didn't even catch that. That it's like yeah, it's your book, but at the same time, didn't you get to spell it the way you wanted to? But so you identify three real main core pillars of e-commerce growth. Um, and I, I wanted to run through those a little bit for each person, because a lot of what mm-hmm. we're trying to talk about here is helping brands get from 10 million to hundred million. And in, in order to go from one to 10, I would say there's some strategy that's involved, but a lot of this, a lot of one to 10 can be done almost by accident. And I hate to say it that way because it takes a lot of hard work and a lot of thoughtfulness, but you 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 can do it almost with coming up with your own ideas about the strategy without necessarily having to rely on everybody else's ideas for strategy. But to go from 10 to 100, it, it, it challenges a lot of founders. And this is where a lot of founders find themselves needing to completely change up what they're doing, sometimes undoing what they did and doing a completely different growth plan. And I feel like that's where this comes into play. What are those three pillars that you identify in this book? And then I want to kind of run through each one of them a little bit. Okay. Just to clarify, in the book, I had six critical sure. pillars. However, the first, after the first two chapters, I dealt with the three most important. Sure. The first was brand core, just, just ensuring that whatever you're doing is brand led. And I speak to, to branding personality, to, 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 to brand personality, to, to a brand, to, to a brand. The second was customer data, particularly as it relates to to, to about three levels. One is mm. just data discipline in, in terms of the data discipline, collecting data in a clean and an efficient way. Two is using people, tools, and systems to interpret the data into insights. And three is actually making decisions. How do you make the right decisions off the back of the, yes. the data you, you talk about? And then the the the, the 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 actually prior to that is 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 customer behavior. How do you sell? How do you get people to take action? It's particularly repetitive action. So when my um, my 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 body cream is or my 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 you know my body cream is is depleted. What has been programmed in me, probably mm-hmm. by brand and through habit, to get me to purchase that brand over and over again? You know, the the key the the key reasons why I get that repetitive, you know, um, you know, um, experience essentially repetitive behavior with with, with commerce. So, so those are the, like the three most important. But to sure. give you the five, one's customer centricity, which is like prioritize every single thing you do for your customers. Second is brand identity and storytelling. The third is data to make, you know, data driven decision making. The fourth is cross functional strategy. The fifth is omni channel presence and adaptability, which is very critical for that 10 to 100, you know, yes. um, growth 
perspective. And the sixth is continuous improvement, you know, and experimentation, which can start out with A-B split testing on your UX, but you could actually A-B split test your, your, in your supply chain, um, you know, um, packaging, yes. suppliers, marketing channels. It, it's just yeah. like having that, that, that culture of experimentation across the board. So every chapter sort of revolves around all these six principles in some way, shape or form. So if you look at customer centricity, the first three chapters actually speak to customer centricity, which is that brand identity um, where you create this persona of a brand that's almost like a being to 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 customers people customers perceive you know certain characteristics cer- certain behaviors from your brand certain yeah. traits from your brand and feel a certain way if your brand doesn't make people feel a certain way you know then then you're doing it wrong so right so that's again very people centered the second right. chapter which is customer behavior is people centered centered you know you, you you know for you to really get them to take action and the third which is customer mm-hmm. data is it's really quantifying customer behavior. So you then trigger them to, to carry out certain actions, whether it's to view your ads, whether it's to click through your ads, but are you collecting mm-hmm. the data and interpreting the data appropriately? So, and then after that, I just talk generally about, you know, things, everybody talks about customer acquisition, retention, you know, um, and, and so many other things, affiliate marketing. I speak a lot yeah. about influencer marketing, you know, in, in, in the book, there are about 18 chapters in, in total. That's yeah, that's fantastic. I've been excited for this to come out. Um, you sent me a little bit of the early manuscript, but I'm excited to see the whole thing here now. Um, let's talk first about brand core uh, of the three. We, we listed brand core, customer data and customer behavior. Um, when you talk about brand core, you know, one of the things you talked about is how this is this is more than just about your logo this isn't necessarily about your, you know, your color scheme. This is about just how do you show up in a person's mind, more or less, right? What, yes. what tell, take me through brand core from what people need to understand if you're a $10 million business and you want to get to $100 million, what needs to change within your brand core or what's, what do you need to change in your own thinking about your brand? So, so first things first, I a very good question, by the way. First things first, I, I think you need to start out with your values, you know, as a brand. Yeah. So whittle it down to, and I'm not talking about your personal values. I'm talking about values that, that would outlive you. I'm hoping that people listening to this podcast want to build businesses that they either eventually want to sell to like, you know, people who would continue to run their, to, to grow their legacy mm-hmm. or they can hand over to the next generation, right? So if you look at any, any business, you know, any, any business that any of, in in those two categories, there are some core values. Like if you look at Ben and Jerry's, for instance, it has clear brand core values, right? Not to say that that is instrumental. That is the, it's, it's silver bullets, you know, to, 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 to success, but they know what. They, they know what not to do, which is more important than knowing what to do on a regular basis. And, and I think when you get those values right, um, sometimes it's a, if like you, you have two co-founders, it's a blend of you know, certain values extrapolated from each of the founders. And then you find it's like more like a Venn diagram. So for Octillion, we did a, a brand, va- uh, it was a brand value extraction exercise. We worked with a storyteller. And he, mm. it was almost like a, um, it was almost like a, 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 a shrink exercise or like a shrink session really with him. He went deep sure. into my story. Um, and I realized I had certain values. I didn't even know that I was just acting on. Um, and, and then, um, he did the same. These were like private sessions with my co-founder with IO. And at the end of it, he came up with with, with a, with a brand story and, and he came up with, with, um, with, with our values, with the values. And then we, we sat down and we had a session, a very long session on whether those values actually aligned. And we, we took certain things, we kept most of what he, he extrapolated. We put certain things aside and we came up with, with a brand value. Now you're a consumer brand and you need to, to also think about, you know, what impact, what are the values you, 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 you want to sort of, you know, 
essentially amplify, right? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And 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 so so that's where I'll start out from. Then then the next is is really getting your story right, right? So a lot of people, a lot of us, will sort of hinge to um, a conversation or a memory through stories, you know, um, or through sure. moments, you know. So 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 it's it's also very important that you 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 get your 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 brand, you know, story right right so so you get the brand story right and then you 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 get the the brand values right then i think you need to start to build like equity and understand like your positioning in the market you need to really understand okay um you know where do we really fit in in this market now one of the things we do in octillion um is when we acquire a brand we work with a brand strategy agency and these guys don't come up with colors and tones and logos and, and all of that sure. stuff. They, they really look into the, they look outwards in the market at what is going on and they look inwards. Um, they take all the values inwards, they look outwards and they try and find a blue ocean strategy for us. So where can we fit in, in this quadrant? Now, I'm not an expert in, in this, but I would say if you haven't already, if you're a $10 million brand and you haven't, yeah gotten a brand strategy piece from a brand agency where they extract yes. extract your 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 um your values even the customer persona de- defining who your customer your, your customer persona is and, and all of that good stuff do it asap because that is a fundamental that will essentially drive your packaging information your website yeah. content um, you know, you, the, the partners you choose to work with. So I like to think that some people, you know, some, some, some people running, um, e-commerce businesses are B Corp. So one of the things about being a B Corp sure. company is, um, in order for you to actually get that accreditation, you, they look at your supply chain. Are you, are you doing what you, you claim to, to be doing, you know, as a B Corp, you know, how right. are you selecting your partners? Because it's not just about what you do; it's about you know what the other people who you associate you associate you know with do. And then when you make decisions, because you have your values, right? Because you have your values, um, you're not go- you're, you're 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 going to have fewer options. Mm-hmm. I, I was speaking sure. with my founder today, yeah. and um, we were talking about um, you know we need to do this and that, and I said, look, one of the values is. You know, this has been a lean operation. We need to, you know, do certain things. And then there was no more sort of argument. We we realized when we're sort of like deliberating, we leaned back on our values mm-hmm. and and that just enabled decision making to be easier for us internally. And yes. and that sort of self-selects people who are going to be attracted to your brand in the first place. Right. And the people you yeah. work with, it will determine the influencers you decide to work with because it'll be aligned with your values. Right. And and how you yes. talk, how you turn up. And at the end of the day, you can run surveys every now and then to understand how is our brand making people feel. I'm not talking about customer service thing. It's just when you see our brand, how how do you what what are the first few things, you know, that that um that pop up in in, in your mind. And it will also even guide your creatives, you know, um, if, if you have, you know, rock solid values. And that's why you, you tend to find that a lot of like um, eco-friendly brands, I'm talking again in the food space, will, um, will, will, will be brown. And then they'll, they will, it's not because oh, the, the agency chose the brown, um, because most brown things look more natural and they're likely going to be eco-based. They're, they're normally brown and green. Sure. <laughs> All right. Sure. But again, yeah. within that space, you'd want to differentiate, right? That reminds me of, you know, we've actually done a lot of the brand values for ourselves as well uh, as an agency. And, and that, to your point of being able to make decisions, it's been very huge because not only does it make, you know, us, uh, me and my, my uh, partner better able to make decisions, it enables everybody on the team to make better decisions as far as does this align with what we're trying to do. Um and so I can see the value in that, but I think really where you went with this is that idea of, let's say everything up until that first 10 million, that is your MVP. And if you want to be a sustainable brand though, now you have to just think about beyond whatever that hook or that catch was that was able to help you carve out a niche within the market. Now you have to establish 
what is that long term thing that you want people to always have like this this you know uh, rut carved into their brain that this is who you are and that's what creates sustainability and that's what allows you to ride through economic downturns or whatever else takes place because there will be a lot of ups and downs but mm -hmm. if you have carved that out in somebody's mind uh, they're able to overlook mistakes that you make as a brand because you will make mistakes as a brand for the same reason that you make mistakes as a human being um, but they're mm -hmm. able to overlook a lot of those things they're able to see you for who you are you know continuing to aspire to be and I think that allows them to even sometimes say there was a, a quote by Jeffrey Gittimer uh, that I appreciated where he said, um, all things being equal, people will do, do business with their friends. And then you mm. flip the page, all things being not quite so equal, people will still do business with their friends. And mm. so let's talk about this idea of if you can carve into your mind why they're friends with you for whatever reason this might be, but like whatever that brand is and why they've associated you as being this the, you have the ability to charge maybe a little bit more than somebody else that's not in that same type of positioning statement um, because mm -hmm. they say, but I, but you represent what I represent. My values align with your values. And it's not just some platitude that you're saying in order to get sales, they can see that this is a part of every single thing that you're doing within the company. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You, know, you, you, you couldn't have said it any, any, any clearer. It's, it's been that friend, being a friend with, your customers you know it's yeah it's critical and and they're they're, they're in, in 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 the book i i think i mentioned about eight just critical bits of, of brand you know of, of being a brand of your brand strategy one was identity the other was like the mm. the architecture you know your brand family extensions your vision your culture your yeah. environment your insight and you know strategic plan which is which is what you get an agency to, to execute upon. But the output, as you've just said, is being a friend, you know, being that friend when we're not talking about being a platonic friend, but, but just right. being that, that friend being first top in mind when, you know, when they're in buy mode. Yeah. So you talked about, okay, so first is that mission, the vision, the personas. And then I think the second part that you mentioned is, is the do's and the don'ts, right? Where you get into a little bit more of the nitty gritty, you know, what, what do you mean by that? What are some of the do's? What are some of the don'ts? The, the don'ts are like, I'll give you an, an example for, for, for one of our, our brands, Lean Caffeine, Please. Um, where, where uh, we, we started out with this, um, with this notion that, um, whatever you put in your body, you know, should be clean. And the founder who sold it to us founded this company off the back of losing his father to, to a, a, a degenerative disease that was caused by like, or probably mm. caused by like over, over consumption of glucose or sugar. So he came with this, you know, um, I'm going to sort of encourage a low carbohydrate diet with all of the things that, you know, I sell with all of the products I sell. So one of the don'ts in that business is, is sugar, mm. you know, so we'll, we'll never sell anything sugary in, in that brand. We'll, we're, we're, we're only good for you. Right. So in, in my, my opinion, you need to define good, good, good is, is, is from, is, is all about yeah. perspective. You know, at the same time you could, you know, come from, or, you know, I had a very, very horrible childhood. I never, you know, experienced anything. And every time I, I had sugar, these kind of, you know, maybe retro sweets. I really loved it. And this is why I'm creating this candy brand. Yeah. And that's yeah. good. That's a good you're putting in there. Obviously you, you need to sort of regulate the overconsumption as with anything, mm -hmm. the, the danger of overconsumption, but you define that good and everything outside that parameter of good, or most of the things outside the parameter of that good is probably bad. Um, so it's really yeah. down to, 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 to that. Um, once you defined, you know, um, the, the good, you, you, your, your core values, you, you'd be able to, 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 to figure out, um, the, the don'ts, um, some might be very prize led, you know, in terms of value. So it could be like, you know, so, so you need to think about what are we leading with and what goes counter to what we're leading with. And then that just sort yeah. of give you a, a fine list of, of things that you just, shouldn't you know um be, be 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 doing essentially yeah yeah i like that that's good um it, i saw an ad it was a a roundup article or something of a bunch of old ads and ads that you almost couldn't even believe ever existed in the first place uh, and one <laughs> of them talked about how something along the lines of 
Uh, you need to feed your kids candy sooner. It's good for them. And it was really interesting because now we think that's absolutely absurd. Uh, but at the time, if I remember correctly, there was a significant issue with children being um, too small, more or less. They, 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 they would send them to, to fat camps basically to hmm. fatten them up. They, they did not have enough calories. And so this was a big deal. Hmm. And so at that situation, they were uh, under the idea that they were doing good, right? And in, in the data that they had, they had good reasons for doing this, of trying to support that. We may have different reasons now. And like you said, so it's like sometimes there's a continuum for everything. And so anything that's good, there's a, a limit to that good as well, where there's an overconsumption. And part of your uh, what you should be doing as a brand is if you're pr bringing a good into the market, how do you also make sure that you prevent that good from becoming a bad uh, as well? Yeah. And, and it's, it, they're completely different parameters if you're like in luxury. So like if, if you're trying sure. to make people feel valued, you know, feel important, then it's a different, that, that's your good in the world. Yeah. Um, it, it will come from a place and, you know, there are certain, you know, things you wouldn't do. So you'd be led by quality, by mm -hmm. price, by experience to a very, very high level, you know, so the values of, say Fiat are different from Rolls Royce, you know, so the, the mm -hmm. Rolls Royce experience, you know, locks you the best quality material comfort and, and that guides yeah. your, your, your dues. So you're not going to be sourcing from the same factory as, as Fiat or Ford or <coughs> Pojo. Um, yeah. so, so it's, it's, it's really, what are we setting out to do to change yeah. and what just goes against it completely? That's where I'll start from. And then you, as you, you, you mature, you'd find other things that fall in and out of line. And then there are ethics, right? Mm -hmm. the, the, you need to define, you know, your ethics, you know, what, because, you know, back in the days when you're thinking, oh, I, I just need to make that first 100,000. I just need to make that 1 million. Ethics, are, you're in fight or flight mode. You're, you're not in, if you look at the Maslow, Maslow um, hierarchy of needs, you're, 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 you're at the yeah. base, right? <clears throat> so yep. you, you're not seeking fulfillment in, in any, any way, shape or form. You, you, you're just trying to eat, you're trying to survive. And because yeah. of that, um, your values at that time will, will could be just a bit blurred, faulted. And then as you get comfortable, you know, um, you start to really reflect on, on values and what you could have done and what you can do looking at the future. But there's some brands that from the get go um, have just been, 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 or are just ethical in, in their, in their core. Um, but there's no, yeah right or wrong it all depends we're all going through different you know um stories different races at different paces so it's, it's just the way it is well and what's beautiful about this is again going back to this is not just uh fluffy feel-good stuff about branding this if you're looking to build a brand and you talk about the cost to acquire a customer but then you talk about well what's that ltv and if you can increase that ltv over the given period of time now by a substantial amount um, and the, one of the best ways to do that is to actually have a brand that stands for something, uh, a, a brand that people can align with. And so doing these things can then make it so that way each one of those uh, new customers that you acquire has a better lifetime value. You're more profitable. And so if you're talking about building a sustainable brand, not necessarily a quick drop shipping company, nothing wrong with that. But it's not going to be the same kind of uh, sustainable uh, brand that uh, a brand that invests in these things. And so if you're wanting to go from 10 million to 100 million, you're going to need to start to align on what this brand core is. And I, I think that you've done a great job of, of outlining that. Um, I want to keep us moving then on to the second part of this, uh, which was customer data. And you, you use the term of data discipline, uh, which I really liked, but... Take me through a little bit more about what data discipline means to you and how brands can more effectively use that in growing their businesses. Yeah. So, so I remember I had um, someone in my podcast who was like, um, we have like a master sheet in, in, in his business. I think he was doing like 13 million or so in revenue. And it's like every week, um, leaders, each, each person responsible for each key um, part of the business essentially reports in their bits, they own a part of that spreadsheet. And yeah. it was like, for the first year, they're like, it was just bothersome. It was just bothersome. It was just one extra thing they, they had to do every Friday um, or was it Monday, whenever they, they did it. It was just, you know, but over time, they started to see patterns. 
So yeah. when like they the there's like um a drop in sales or what have you or order volume, they 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 just see patterns. Whether it's AOV dropping, they they will just see patterns off the back of, of that, and it will reflect across the organization. To me, that that is data discipline. And for me, data discipline is turning up every single day, right? And having data literacy. So making sure your mm-hmm. leadership, your your team understand how to collect and how to read data to, to an extent and how to then take action off the back of that collection and reading reading of data. When you read data, you get insights. You can validate those insights with your colleagues if you're not sure about what the potential outcomes are. And because things mm. are cross-functional, <clears throat> you'd find that with a, in a cross-functional en- environment, certain actions or certain pieces of data affect others. So let's say there's a defect in, in a product and you're seeing high return rates and then there are complaints and then you're seeing low conversions. It all just leads on round and round. So if there's a shoot up in customer service um, in, in ticketing, it might mean that that's going to affect conversions in, in a few weeks time. But if you're not tracking it, yeah. it's going to be a longer feedback loop to, 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 to understanding what the problem is in the first place. So with centralization of like key metrics across the board, <clears throat> um, some you collect automatically from an automated standpoint, others just old school manual into a spreadsheet um, and, you know, getting an, express, a, a, an Excel guru to, to, to actually, you know, um, f- put some magic and some formulas in, you, you will be on the right track. And I don't think any 10 million plus business that's not obsessed with data will will make it to their ne- next base camp whatever your next base camp is whether it's 25 whether it's 50 whether it's you know 100 um it's it's just critical to have that discipline which which is built into three layers collection clean data collection mm, yeah this, you know um the the second is is really getting um you know insights through people the right experts who are going to 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 read that data and then systematizing what's you know how 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 that is translated with the right tools and 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 people and systems, and the third is is that decision making. And sometimes you might need to to experiment. You know, I'll put in you know A/B split test, you know into into the mix, yep. and um and and then um you know you 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 actually come with with something that's you know statistically significant and and true, due to um you know rigorous um you know experimentation. But you can't experiment if you don't even have clean data, right? <clears throat> right. And you know what's interesting is, uh, like you said, it, even to get to ten million data, uh, ten million a year in revenue, you would think that most brands have already established these things as all just core parts of their business. But I, I'm always surprised by how little that's true. Um, and one of the trends that I think I've seen for a while is a lot of people that have outsourced so much of their data that they haven't actually owned a lot of that data. Um, and so, you know, I will give a little plug here for a company that I, I like and actually invested a little bit into their community round called Fueled.io. Um, hmm. the, the whole thought here is go ahead and use all of the other attribution tools. Use them. There's nothing wrong with them. Uh, there's a lot that you can learn and benefit from them. Um, but you should still own your own data because five years from now, what's the new AI algorithm that's uh, been updated that can be plugged in to see what kind of insights you get from your data 10 years from now? And if you don't own that data now, starting collecting all of that and at least aggregating it to a point, you're, you're going to be behind in the future of this when those things are there available to you and you don't have the data that you need. So start collecting it, start getting your information from your Google Analytics account, from your Shopify account from your social media accounts, from your uh, customer surveys, from all of the different th- sources that you're getting it, um, and, and at least start getting it all to a point where you're, you're owning that, whether that's, you know, in, um, you know, an S3 bucket or whatever that might be, but, you know, using a tool to get that and start having that data, um, like you said, making sure that it's clean and that you, you, you have the data there, even if you're not going to use it right now, just, just start the collection of it and get it into a place where you, you have that organized. Absolutely, absolutely, and and I I speak to, um, you know, judging people by what they do, not not necessarily what they say. So that's where first party data actually comes comes into play. You know, capturing sure. those those on site actions, 
and then zero party data that's where the nectar is really um email capture sms capture you know um having access you know um and permission to to speaking directly with um with with whoever is interested with your audience essentially it's it's a way of of audience audience building um just so, so important i speak to to, to you know the, the the you know all all four types of you know um you know data levels from zero first second and third party data in fact yeah. this particular chapter this is just off i've never said this in public was a very long chapter as in it was but i had to cut it short <laughs> Um, it was a sure. very, very, very intensive, you know, chapter. I, I went, I went really, really deep in the original and I'll put it in, in the, in the book notes and the chapter notes, you know, for, for those who, who actually purchased the book so they could, you know, see those missing bits, you know, on, on, on my website. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, uh, I can only imagine there's just so much depth that you want to go into on this and, and you can only include so much in a book if it, you want it to still be readable. Um, and so you mm-hmm. got to get to uh, a point where you say, okay, great. If you want further reading, if you want further information, um, go here. And, and so jumping into the third part of this, I want to jump into the, the consumer behavior part too, because I want to have a little bit of time there. Um, being one of the three key pillars that you mentioned, at least if we were going to dial it down to three, consumer behavior being uh, a factor, if you're going to get from 10 million to 100 million, um, it goes beyond just looking at just the data that you have, but now starting to understand your customers in a completely different way. Um, yeah. Take me through, you know, the importance that you see in why you considered uh, consumer behavior being one of the top three. Okay, so we're we're trying to get humans to to take a specific <clears throat> to take action, right? Um, whether it's um, right. first time action on you know which is a first time purchase or a regular purchase, and so. My my thinking here was let's understand how human beings are fundamentally wired, and so I started out with um, with the brain, just talking about the mammalian brain, the reptilian brain, and and the the the, the more human mm-hmm. brain, the neocortex. Looking at the mammalian brain, where most of the decision making is made, it's more emotional, it's more sociable, it's mm-hmm. it's more love, it's just driven by emotions, right? And then when the emotion is is decided upon. And we we rationalize with the, with the neocortex most of the time. Um, so understanding that, mm-hmm. and then obviously with the reptilian brain, we don't know too, too 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 much about it. But it's really for survival, for regulating your temperature. It's <clears throat> it's almost like a, a baseline program that just keeps running, you know, and and keeps everything going. So it's my focus like was the more the mammalian system. brain, <laughs> and, exactly, and and the neocortex. So I moved on to like Maslow's yeah. Mash, Mash hierarchy of needs, and I was like, okay, um, you know, once we we get our physiological needs, the next thing really is our safety needs. We we speak to like love and belonging and friendship, esteem, and then there's self actualization. Mm-hmm. Um, and 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 so my thesis here was, okay, how do we sort of speak to the emotions? So I broke it down in in terms of like uh, the funnel of psychology. So I created a framework called your funnel of psychology, and it started. It starts out with awareness, it moves into consideration, decision, action, and it's essentially it's it's really at the awareness level, which everybody everybody's trying to get attention. Everybody's trying to get awareness. What are the things in your? Or the, what are the tool sets actually? You need psychological tool sets and, and neuroscience tool tool sets. You need to get attention as a brand. I I put it into like about five key categories. One was authority and obedience, and all of this was data backed mm-hmm. um, from 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 um, various studies. Um, it's heavily referenced. The, 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 they wouldn't let me just put my opinion in the book. So it's sure. it's really um, you know authority and obedience. How do you get it? Because the authority and obedience actually triggers in, you know. Um, you informing them about something. So this is how you work with an influencer, for mm. instance. Um, you're 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 mm-hmm. using their influence. You're using their authority to inform, you know, people about you know a product or a brand that exists. Familiarity. You're seeding trust. So people, if people see you over and over and yeah. over and over again, remember vitamin hair or something. There's a there's a where everybody saw it on Kim Kardashian. Saw it on so many influencers that they they just 
there's just somewhat trust on there. Um, and then I talk yeah. about uh, amusement and, and shared interest. So just how, how it leads to creating relatability with people. Mm-hmm. And I also talked about um, attraction, you know, um, just how to build attraction that would enable, you know, um, you trigger like a brand recall. So getting people to, to remember you and over and over again. And then storytelling, um, very important top of funnel, which creates connection. Mm-hmm. You know, so mm-hmm. from there we moved on to like consideration, which is you trying to get people to say, okay, I know this brand, should I buy from them? You know, so when they're in that psychological state, then you need to sort of amplify the pain. Your 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 um your 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 your, your product is is actually you know um taken mm-hmm. away. Um, you need to stimulate mm-hmm. pleasure. So sell them the future. You know what is what's the experience going to look like after they have, um, you know, purchased from you, then you, you feel that you go into like social proof, which yeah. reinforces trust again. And then, um, you, you can offer them, try and get them, um, a dopamine, um, you know, um, jolt as quickly as possible. What do I mean? I, I meant things yeah. like next day delivery. Um, you're going to get a gift sure. instead, like a digital gift. So, so really, really triggering that. And Amazon does it really, really, really well in terms of the instant gratification as best as it can, at least. Um, and then decision and, and action, you know, I, I talk about, okay, how do they, how do you get them to, to buy, which is, okay, they're, they're ready to, to purchase. They want to, they're, they're about to, it's all about stimulating pleasure, you know, social, sorry, I, I, I babbled again. So, so it's, it's those principles um i i went through in customer you know customer behavior i thought i spoke a lot about authority trust relatability you know attraction and and that was really the concept of like i think the core thing to take away is we're emotional beings and you're trying Mm -hmm. to trigger emotions um when nobody knows about you you're trying to trigger certain emotions and there are certain tools in your tool sets which you could reference in the book to to, to help you gain or garner attention and you know as 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 people get to know your brand more and more for you to push them further into the you know um further closer to, to the to the finish line that the other toolkits psychological toolkits you can use I'm not just talking about um, in in copy, but in design, <clears throat> in UX and experience to get them, you know, over 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 the board. So once you understand those fundamentals, um, whether you're a, you're you're a first time brand builder or you know you're you're a veteran brand builder, you know these these are these are fundamentals with with good references. Yeah, and I think that you know we talk about this a lot at our company at Element, uh, where if you let's just even say you made a purchase as a customer um, and the next thing that you get from that brand is another ad asking you to buy more. You haven't received a shipping confirmation. You haven't received the, the product itself. You don't know if you like it. You've received no other you know communication other than they're immediately seeing another uh, ad on Facebook to buy again. Um, it doesn't do very good from a psychological perspective of getting that customer really ingratiated to you and and on your side and becoming your friend. And so we talk a lot about just romancing customers. And one of the best things that you can do then is, you know, let's say immediately after they make that purchase, what can you do to sweep them off of their feet, even before they receive the product that they've ordered that they're excited about? Um, and this could be a, more of like a video in uh, an ad where they're going to see um, how the product is used. And they're, they're already excited about it, but if they see the product being used or they see the product being cherished and loved by someone else again, and they're like, okay, I am really excited about this. Or um, it could be something that you're doing in the environment to help the world, something that they care about as well. All of these things can be those moments where it's like, okay, I'm excited about the product. I don't have it yet, but you get to that that dopamine hit, like you mentioned a little bit more. They're like, wow, I love this brand. And now I don't even have the product, but I can't wait to tell other people about it. Um, and now when they see the ad to buy again uh, a little bit later, they're much more likely to take that action with joy instead of being annoyed that they're still seeing ads mm-hmm. to purchase again. Y- yes, indeed. So <clears throat> it's, it's really important that um, the what the tactile experience 
um, how people relate mm-hmm. with your product, the the unboxing experience, the um, the utility of the product really lives to to that initial promise. Um, so so it's full circle. Um, don't overpromise. Don't blow up um, with exaggeration in in it prior to them actually giving your 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 product you know a go don't blow blow it out of proportion sometimes it does work with hypnosis so if if um and that sure. is, hypnosis is not really the word if, if it's good for celebrity big celebrity x it's good enough for me and they're saying that and they they're just social we're just social animals right um so so that right. influence has submitted them to compliance right so they're they're socially sure. compliant now uh, but at the end of the day, good do good stuff in the world, and you know make good products. Um, which all your listeners in, in in the Blue Arrow, you know, podcast already, you know, I trust they they're, they're already doing that. It's it's really with that in place. Yeah. How do we tap into you know um, psychology, customer behavior to towards you know um, you know triggering further growth and making customers happy happier? Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and you called out even like the trust of influencers, and that's good enough for them. Um, this is tangential, but I believe that you mentioned that you had a brand uh, that, that grew to $3 million based only on influencer relationships. Is that correct? Yeah, pretty much. Pretty much. We, we acquired a brand yeah. in stealth. Um, it, it, it's a beauty okay. brand. And they we're, we're doing we're, we're undergoing a, a rebrand of this brand right now. Um, so, but but we're still we've we, we run this company, and um, what they they're a two year old company. So it was um in two years they 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 already a three million um in revenue, and essentially they were working with a plethora of um macro and mega influencers on a purely performance basis. And mm. I had to sort of humble my performance marketing expert self to really understand what was going on. And when I understood what was going on, I was like, this is freaking genius. You know, um, they, they utilize a number of, again, psych- psychological, <clears throat> um, um, you know, yeah. toolkits, you know, so, so one of which is authority for compliance from people they trust. So those are, so those people, they, they would initially send sure. their, their product to, to those people and those people have to trust the product. <laughs> you know, they trust the product first mm-hmm. and um, they, they then um, obviously pay their fee. They represent the brand and um, there's urgency in, in the mix. So what do I mean by urgency? The, the, there's there's a call to action that okay there's a sale going on right now I've partnered up with them and you have only so much time mm-hmm. to get this offer um, and you know it's a it's a, an offer not you know too good to be <laughs> too good to be missed so they it just gives them this sense of value and they 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 they, they go in and and purchase and these are like um, in the range of a hundred to two hundred dollars, you know, um, the, the, these the, these goods are in the range of hundred two hundred dollars. Um, they buy them. There's obviously a guarantee, a ninety day guarantee. So the funnel is is really really yeah. really tight. Um, but the one thing I took away from the business also is like, do not be mesmerized by names, right? So they go by the mm. metrics, <laughs> by the metrics. You know, so whether it's views, clicks, yeah. in, they go by the metrics on on the platforms that they um, choose to, to 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 promote on, and it's just phenomenal how like you know when we talk about like oh we're going to increase conversion rates. To me, sometimes conversion rate is a it's a construct. <laughs> so what we mm-hmm. found is some influencers with the same exact funnel can generate conversion rates as, as high as 7% from their traffic and others wow. will generate conversion rates of like 2%, right? So mm-hmm. it's down to their brand equity as influencers and the trust. Mm. I think the the tangible value from brand equity is trust. 
right? People yeah. trust the brand. So they'll use the brand. They'll patronize the brand because the trust level is high. I think trust is a very, very key marker to many, many things. And if they're in buy mode because they trust the brand, whatever brand they have the highest trust in tends to win, unless if they're price sensitive. So faced with no price sensitivity, yeah. they'll go with the brand that they trust the right. most. So with with this brand, it's also taught me that there's some influencers. How do you measure? My challenge now is how do we measure trust in a brand beyond just numbers, right? Um, sometimes you could see it in yeah. click in their average click through rates. Well, others, not quite so. But it's till you test, till you experiment, you you do not know. So we we value yeah. them on like what did what was you know on site conversion rate for for this particular you know influencer. But it's it's hard to to determine if like you run if in a single day five influencers so give you a shout out or you know talk about your offer. Um, but but yeah, this 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 brand is very offer driven, and so there's that urgency, and um, the, yeah. there's a good you know um, discount, and you know people just patronize it. So I learned a lot off the back of um, how to run like performance driven influencer marketing campaigns, and you know, um, and it's all about data. It's all about data. Well, yeah, that's cool. Yeah, it, data and trust. Um, yeah, data and trust. So yeah, absolutely. Currently, I yeah, I want to I want to dig in a little bit into who is Coonley Campbell then as well, because um, I think it's really fun to see the the personal side of this. You already touched a little bit on uh, what it was like for you growing up there in Nigeria, um, but you had also talked to me a little bit about um, some interesting. Uh, health issues that you had gone through that, that kind of led up to even just like one of your core values. Um, what happened? What was going on? Okay. So, um, I think I left, I, I didn't respect myself in my twenties. Um, I just didn't, sure. I, I, I didn't respect my body, you know, um, there's, um, in, in most Abrahamic, you know, religions, you know, there, there's, there's a term, I believe it's in all three of them, which is like your your body's the temple of God, you know. So so yeah. whether you're you're Jewish, Christian, or Muslim, it's like your body's the temple of God, and it truly is. It truly is. And um, I abused my body really. And I'm not saying I, I did hard drugs or anything. I was just like not not exercising, sure. eating what I wanted to eat, you know. And it didn't go well, you know. So I had um, an inflammatory yeah. disease at 29. Um, I, I thought I was invisible. I was also just cocky, really, um, with my my body. Um, so, so yeah. I, I had this, um, some of you may know it. It's so initially, um, you know, I just was weak. I, I, I had a swelling of my, my eyes, my eyes were swelly. Um, the, the all swollen up. Um, my, I had joint pains all over. Um, and you know, the doctors didn't know what was going on. You know, they, they just didn't know. So I went for a scan, an MRI scan. They wanted to sort of scan my abdomen. Um, and, you know, they, they thought I had a lymphoma, which is like um, cancer of the, the lymph nodes. <clears throat> um, mm -hmm. But they then, um, you know, carried out, um, you know, further tests and they realized it was, it was not lymphoma. So they canceled that out. Um, so I went to see an ophthalmologist for my eye just my, my eyes, my eyes were swollen. And then he was like, look, I know what this is. This is sarcoidosis. Apparently it's like, you know, my, wow. my, my immune system was overreacting and it just led to like an inflammatory response, you know, to those, the, there must've mm -hmm. been some sort of infection. I suspect it was bird flu in 2009. And, mm -hmm. um, for me, that was a close touch to death before I got the, um, <clears throat> you know, the, the medication, which was like steroids, it was like it was a shave, close shave to that. I couldn't, I, I couldn't walk. You know, I remember it was it was a winter. It was it, this happened over winter, so I couldn't. I was scared to go out because I didn't want to to slip. So there in there, wow. out in my twenty nine year old body, I realized that um, I felt like like an ill seventy year old man. Um, Jeez, but but. but I, I got the I got I got good treatment um, and I got better, but I was still taking the steroids. And um, 
I think that's the only time I've been suicidal because I, I the pain got so much. Mm. I was like, oh. what is the point? What really is the point? You know, what, what is the point? Uh, it's the only time in my life I've ever thought about, you know, take, taking my, my life. So, so, um, you, I, 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 I got, I, when I got my health back, but with drugs on drugs on with prednisolone and, you know, many of these very harsh, um, you know, um, drugs, I, I just cherished it. So, um, I started to lose bone density off the back of the steroids, as you know, some of you may know. And mm-hmm. I made a decision that I was just, I just told the doctors because I was on a low dosage anyway. I said, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm not taking any other drugs. And this time I was not coming from a, um, um, from a, from a cocky, you know, perspective. I just thought, look, my, bo- I've lost about 20% of my bone density. What have you 15, 20%. I don't want to lose any more because of these drugs. What can I do? And this yeah. is the power of community. So I, I was a member of this sarcoidosis community, which was predominantly in America, but was all over the world. Uh, and I spoke to other people who, you know, had gone off the drugs and what they were doing. And they're like, you know, you got to lift weights. You know, you've got to be active again, you know, avoid anti- sure. anti-inflammatory foods. And that's why I did. I stuck to that and I haven't looked back. I've, I've been, I think I'm strongest now <laughs> in my forties, in my early forties, um, than, um, I'm 43. Yeah. I'm, 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 I'm stronger. I'm strongest now than I, um, <laughs> in most times in my life, you know, and, and I just stuck with it. And I believe in taking personal responsibility for your health. So if there's mm. something wrong with me, I try and figure it out myself initially. You know, I, 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 I measure my metrics. I have a whoop and an Apple watch. Um, awesome. you know, I, I check my, my blood pressure every now and then I, I go for my blood works, you know, and I'm always curious on like, you know, medical tech, you know, just out there. I want to take responsibility. Yeah. I want to read my own metrics. Right. Um, but it, yeah. it has changed me to just that personal responsibility and ownership for, um, for life. And, and again, I've got kids now. So at the time I didn't have kids, I've got kids and you mm-hmm. want to be, you know, there for, you know, it's a bit cliche, but you want to be there for them and their kids. So um, you got to do what Absolutely. you've got to do it's now. A powerful motivator now. You've got to invest. A lot. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. It's a very powerful motivator. I've got so, kids. So as I don't well start. Uh, so, so typically before I, think- I start work i i just have to to do something physical you know um yeah. just before so i i sort of serve my my, my body for just ensuring that there's you know i've done something physical first um before mm. I, I i get into anything intellectual or um cognitive i think that's really smart um that's really deep and I appreciate you sharing that because I think that there's a lot of other people who listen to this who likely are going through something similar, whether it's, you know, sarcoidosis or, or, or just something of, of needing to reflect and say, is this, am, am I treating my body right? Uh, because all of the other goals and visions and dreams that you have for yourself aren't going to be very effective if you can't live to get to them. Um, and so we don't, we're not in charge of whether or not we live or die, uh, but there are certain things that we can take into our own power that we do know to be healthier than not. And so mm-hmm. um, taking that responsibility, I think, is a, is a big, huge first step uh, in the right direction. So congrats to you, man. Thank you. Um, you also had mentioned to me, uh, you know, there's a this idea of if you weren't doing this, if you weren't uh, doing e-commerce, uh, what else would you be doing? Because I feel like you're somebody who seems like you have dug into a lot of areas and you have a lot of knowledge about a lot of different things. I have to imagine there are some other things that you you could do, um, but you've you've chosen to devote yourself right now to the e-commerce stuff. But what what else would you be doing if it wasn't e-commerce? That's a good one. Music. I'll probably be. Uh, a producer really? so I'm, I'm i'm probably crap at singing but like recently i've i've gone into house music so um it's actually progressive house or you know minimal house and i've paired that up with like my running so the reason why i like house mm. is 
it makes you emotional, but it's it's this 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 minimal house and progressive house, but it it doesn't make you 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 it's balanced. It's a very balanced genre of music. So I will make music or I'll be a DJ, you know, to to for loads of people to enjoy, you know, the serotonin that music just gives you if you if you opt to 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 receive that blessing of music music is a blessing to me Mm -hmm. um it's a mood changer um it can actually dictate my day if i listen to something rough and hard and totally you know um in some ways negative it could affect my throughput say when i'm working out so i started running i don't like running per se but i like how i feel after i finished a run so I prefer to, mm-hmm. to, you know, less emotional music, and it's, it really verges towards instrumental. Classical is a bit too harsh for for for, for those, but but house music, progressive house music, is just perfect. Yeah. I would make music, and I, I just I, and I, I I don't write music. I don't play an instrument. My my kids do, but like I I just appreciate rhythm. I and I think mm. I I also listen to layers. I listen to music in 3d in my head um so i know so i'm like okay this guy's using uh he's using a synthesizer here he's on a piano how did he use the strings here i i i i can relate to it i'm like oh wow that is genius you know so that's what mm. i'll probably be be doing um and i want to do, i want to do it I don't, I don't think there's anything really stopping besides the time it's really the yeah. time you know um but i would love music well i would really love music to to get into music Maybe a thing in the future. Um, that's something that we share. I love music as well. I, I actually, uh, my original plan was to go for a degree in commercial music. Um, wow. So I, I completely respect that. Uh, that said, and I, I feel the same way that you do, that music can make or break a day and, you know, a good song can really make a moment. Um, what is your what is your go-to song then? If, if, do you have a song that you're like, this is a song if I'm having a rough day, this is a song that really just kind of shakes me out of it. Uh, no, not really. But I, I, I like anything from from this musician musician called um, Amtrak, an artist called Amtrak, A M T R A C. Um, dude okay. is is good. He's, he's American. I thought he was European. Um, he just he just makes. I'm uh, you know I started to listen to him like two summers ago. And he just he 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 just he just lit that summer up, you know, for me. And, and so cool. what I did is in my Spotify is I just created a radio for Amtrak, and Spotify is pretty good with recommendations on like similar music to him. Um, but he's like my fave of of every progressive sort of um, you know cl- house house um, club artist you know out there. Um, yeah. Yeah, uh, I wish. I just wish. I was into Moby in the in the nineties. Oh um, yeah, but he he yeah. kind of he 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 kind of wore off <laughs> me late later late later on. I yeah, as in just that genius of instrumentals, you know, of just putting mm-hmm. and then what and then what's even more genius is if you you then use voice you use your you know use um your, your voice however it's it's delivered as an instrument you know that uh, blends in with the other yeah. instruments you're very empathetic to 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 the harmony that's been established and then you you weave in yourself and it just comes in as pure pure bliss in in my ears you know i uh, just well i'm track as a guy sorry for the long wide it answer typical of those long wide i love answers. it anyway i i need to check out some of his stuff now um yeah. and you know you mentioned uh abrahamic re- uh, religions and so i'm christian and uh one of the things that the bible talks a lot about is uh that the that god spoke the world into existence um, and I kind of think of that maybe not just so much speak, but maybe even sing, right? It doesn't say the mm. sing, but I think why wouldn't he if he created all of the different pieces of this? And I've seen an image that I really appreciated, uh, which shows the harmonic series. Not, I guess I should go this way, but shows the harmonic series. And then it shows almost like a, a cross section of a conch shell and they look identical. Like it's, it's, mm. it's unbelievable how much they look alike. And when you think about just that idea of it's like every little vibration 
um, maybe when he spoke the world into existence or and even saying this, that, that mm. he used the very uh, mathematical fundamentals of music to create the structures and everything uh, that we see here right now too, which I think is a really interesting mm. and, and uh, cool way to think about just how much music resonates with us. Mm. Mm. It's incredible. It's an incredible, you know, um, yeah, those pot ends, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Pot ends, uh, very, very, yeah. They're, they're int- very, very interesting, very insightful. Um, when, when you see pot ends, um, yeah. yeah, that's what I'll say for now. <laughs> Cause I could no, go on good. and on. So, but- and maybe we will on another one. So Kunli, uh, if, if people wanted to reach out to you, follow you, connect with you, buy your book, what is the best way for them to get in touch? Um, so they can um, just connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, I I try and post once a week on LinkedIn or, or Twitter. Or just email me, reach out to me on, on either Kunle at octaliancapitalpartners.com or Kunle at 2xecommerce.com to connect. Um, I... I'm, my podcast is currently on a summer break at the moment. So we're doing replays at this point in time, but, but 2X e-commerce is a good place to just, um, you know, appreciate some of my work and some of the interviews. Um, I'm being very mindful with the interviews I'm taking these days. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm on, on, on socials, 2X e-commerce, Octillion Capital Partners, you know, um, yeah, I'd love to, to say hi to, 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 to your audience, to, to, to your friends and my friends. And, um, yeah, if anybody, if, if anything resonated to you today, you know, and you want to sort of take it a step further, let me know. I don't do consulting, so, um, we'll just have a chat, a chitty chat out. Right. So nice one. Yeah. And I encourage anybody to, to take him up on that there, especially, you know, check out the book. I'm excited to read it, uh, all the way through myself as well, but, podcast i've been a big fan of you and your podcast for a long time now as well um and so if you are in the e-commerce space and you aren't currently following kunli you you need to be um so i will i will throw that behind there as well kunli thank you so much for coming out and chatting through Cheers, all well. this with us sharing your time and your wisdom today appreciate it well really really appreciate it. thank you so much cheers thanks for listening to the up arrow podcast with william harris We'll see you again next time and be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes.